Hello, I'm Joe Kasser, and I'd like to welcome you to this presentation on using object-oriented systems engineering to make a cup of coffee. Give me a moment, and I will switch over to PowerPoint. Before I talk about object-oriented systems engineering, the traditional systems engineering life cycle, starting in the A paradigm, begins with identifying the needs, developing the system requirements, designing the system and subsystems, constructing the subsystems, testing the subsystems, integrating and testing the system, transitioning into operations, operations and maintenance, and then disposal. OOSC starts with the problem discovery state, solution conceptualization state, architecture development, and then traditional remainder of the systems development process and the system life cycle. But it does it without using written requirements. And I'm going to show you in this presentation just one example. By using the word problem and solution in the states of the life cycle, I show how OOSC aligns with the problem solving process. The problem solving process really shows up best in the front end. The problem discovery state maps into Derek Kitchen's version of the problem solving system development process in defining the problem space. This is where we understand the as-is situation and what is undesirable about it. We may even model it in this state and build a model of the undesirable situation. The solution conceptualization state is when we conceive a solution and this is the 2B situation and we might model it again as well. So we end up with two models. Once we have a conceptual solution, we then create the preliminary architectures or we then create candidate architectures built out of components and the components may be hardware or they may even be software. We then identify solution selection criteria to select between the candidate architectures, do the trade-off, make the selection and then formulate the strategies and plans to implement them. So by the time we get to the end of the front end we know exactly what system, what subsystems we're going to build and that's the rest of the system development process. So object-oriented systems engineering maps the problem-solving process into the system development process, considers systems and subsystems as objects, replaces requirements and specifications with desired functional or behavioral and non-functional attributes and properties of objects, uses inheritance and templates to minimize the probability of providing the wrong solution, facilitates verifying and validating the as-built attributes equal or exceed the desired attributes at the end of each state in the system development process, and is based on a fully integrated information environment for process and product data, not just models. Although models are used at appropriate times, access in the IIE. As I just showed a moment ago, we model the as-is and we model the to-be sy systems and situations if that's appropriate. There are other tools that can be used for analysis such as prototyping. So OOSE is model-based systems engineering on steroids, where steroids is systems thinking eliminates requirements and objectively increases customer delight and satisfaction. The cup of coffee case study is simple but also complex enough to demonstrate both OOSE and gaps in the traditional paradigm and things that we could do better. Fred is a new employee at Snow Microsystems. Snow Microsystems is a project-based matrix organization serving several customers. Fred has been assigned to a project. On the first morning he briefly meets his home department boss who introduced him to his project leader then excused herself and asked him to meet her at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee. The problem-solving process started when Fred was asked to meet his boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee contained Fred's activities in defining and remedying the problem, and ends when Fred brings his boss a cup of coffee at 3.30 p.m. without spilling it. And notice that without spilling it has been added in as a misuse case. 
bringing the cup of coffee is the use case, spilling it is the misuse case, and spilling it has attributes of cup and process because you can do things in the process to minimize the probability of spilling it or you could do things in the cup to minimize the probability of spilling the coffee. The problem discovery state started when I notice I'm using a template. The state started when contained and ended. It helps create the information. So the problem discovery state started when the boss asked Fred to meet her at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee. It contained Fred being surprised and the boss leaving Fred with a problem. And it ended when the boss excused herself and the stakeholders, and that's Fred and the boss, agreed that Fred meets the boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and brings her a cup of coffee. In this example, Fred didn't have any choice. The state also ended when the stakeholders, that's Fred and the boss, agree that Fred meets the boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and brings her a cup of coffee. In general, the state ends when the cost and schedule are acceptable and feasible. And in this instance, the boss knows it's feasible, otherwise she wouldn't have asked Fred to make the cup of coffee. Or are we assuming that? Hmm. So how do we do it without requirement? Well, we have a problem. What needs to be accomplished? And to help us, and to help us do that without requirements, we use the concept of inheritance and templates. So we have a template. A cup of coffee is a system. We know what's in it. Cup, coffee, water, sweetener, creamer, or milk. Because it's an instance of a class of systems. It's been done before. There's the cup. I notice I'm using templates as we go along all the way through this presentation. Here's, here's another example. Started when, contained, ended when. The solution conceptualization state started when the stakeholders agree with the definition of the problem. Contained Fred visualizing himself meeting the boss at 3.30 in our office and bringing a cup of coffee. Notice that I'm carrying the wording through all the way through. I'm not paraphrasing it. I'm not using synonyms. I'm taking the wording all the way through. It minimizes the introduction of errors. In this simple case it's a little boring but in a complex case there'd be a lot of other information in between so it wouldn't appear as boring. Fred asking his team leader the key question, what kind of coffee does the boss like? He gets the answer, brewed office coffee with two teaspoons of sugar and no creamer in her own cup. He does a little risk management to make sure that everybody was giving him the same answer. Fred finding out that the boss has her own cup of coffee in the kitchenette, as do some of the other employees. And Fred developing a preliminary plan for what to do to safely provide the boss with an acceptable cup of coffee. The state ended when Fred visualized himself meeting the boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bringing her the cup of coffee. And Fred has a preliminary plan for what to do to realize the conceptual solution. The generic conceptual solution has the same attributes as or exceeds the attributes of the problem. Basically what will be accomplished, a preliminary plan for how to accomplish it, and the key questions are, does any inherited attribute need to be changed or marked as don't care or not applicable and what additional attributes if any are needed in this situation. So here's the generic conceptual solution. A cup of coffee contains a cup ingredients coffee water sweetener cream and milk. This is the what. But in our case we already know some of those hows. For example, the coffee is brewed and the sweetener is water. So we have that information and we modify the template accordingly. So we end up with the properties. The cup, we're not concerned about it because it's the boss's cup. We inherit volume and water temperature and water amount from the properties or attributes of a generic cup of coffee. The coffee type we know it's commercial off the shelf in the office. 
the amount of coffee is going to be one cup full and spill proof. We still have to design the process and the product to make sure it's spill proof. We know the sweetener is sugar, we know it's two amounts, and we know there is no creamer or milk, so we don't care about the type, but we do care about none. So the benefits of OSE show up right here, inheritance and templates. And the attributes are exactly the same as those of well-written requirements. They're feasible, atomic, verifiable, adequate, consistent, understandable, unambiguous, and manageable. Using, so using attributes maximizes the probability of a successful project, and I define that as the completeness of satisfying the needs and it facilitates drawing the real need out of the customer when determining the real problem. Because we've got the template. We can use it as a discussion point. What cup would you like? How high should it be? What diameter? What about volume? How much coffee do you want in the cup? Oh, I love my coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. And I'd like a cup full with a, at least a liter in it. But you know, the liter gets cold. The coffee gets cold when it's sitting on my desk. So wait a minute, we can put our little warming tray under the cup to keep it warm. And all that sort of discussion comes out when we've got a template to work from and that facilitates understanding the real need. The preliminary architecture state template. It started when Fred knows what to do to be able to meet the boss at 3.30 in our office and bring her a cup of coffee. It contained Fred investigating the kitchenette, working out three conceptual ways of how to be able to meet the boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee in her own cup. The three architectures Fred looked at were brewed coffee, instant coffee, and a commercial off-the-shelf purchase from one of the local cafes in the neighborhood. Fred working out the properties of the equipment needed to realize each architecture. If he's using brewed coffee, he needs a percolator or a brewer. If he's using instant coffee, he just needs a kettle and hot water. If he's going to buy commercial off the shelf, then he doesn't need any brewing material. He just needs whatever it takes to either go out and get the coffee, or have it delivered, or have somebody he trusts bring it for him. And Fred performing a feasibility study showing the feasibility of each architecture and verifying that all conceptual physical architecture properties meet or exceed the properties needed at the time the state ends. There is no point in putting forward an architecture that doesn't meet the need, unless all of them don't meet the need, in which case Fred either has to look for another architecture or relax the properties of the need so that one of the architectures will provide it. And during this state, Fred is also creating a draft plan to how to realize each conceptual way, and that's part of his feasibility study. And it ended when Fred has the candidate conceptual feasible ways of how to be able to meet the boss at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee. Let's take a look at the three architectures. Some of the attributes also move to the how. Fred verifies that the specification on the brewing pot provides the coffee at the needed temperature and in the needed volume. The amount of coffee in the cup is set by the cup and the process needs. The cup sets the maximum amount of coffee that can be provided, but the delivery process, namely without spilling, sets the maximum that can actually be put in the cup. Unless, of course, Fred is carrying a pot with him as he walks down the hallway and every time he spills something, he refills the cup or he waits till he gets to the bus's door and then fills the cup from the pot and leaves the pot on the floor outside the bus's office. Fred's creative, but he decided not to be that creative. And since water and coffee are combined in the brewing process, the attributes change water amount attribute becomes coffee amount and water temperature becomes coffee temperature. So the architecture hierarchical or structural form is shown here and the properties are shown here. Cup material is bosses, the coffee temperature is set by the pot. Coffee type is whatever's in the office, the coffee amount is 8 to 10 millimeters down from the cup lip. 
that's what Fred determined would be a good spill proof level. Sugar brand is in the office, sugar amount 2 teaspoons and the creamer or milk again is don't care and we're going to make sure definitely no creamer. Fred has to verify that the pot spec provides the coffee at the needed temperature in the needed volume and the attribute of the amount of coffee in the cup is set by the boss's cup and delivery needs as I explained earlier shown to be 8 to 10 millimeters down from the cup lip and the sugar is in the office, the coffee is in the office still two teaspoons of sugar and the creamer is definitely none and it's left in there for a specific reason which I'll tell you in a moment Architecture B, the instant coffee, is the generic template except we know that the coffee is instant coffee and the sweetener is, is sugar. Remaining decisions to be made are what Cots brand of instant coffee if there's more than one in the kitchenette and sugar if there's white or brown if they're both available lump sugar or powdered sugar. Well we've already decided it's two teaspoons so it's granulated or powdered sugar and these decisions only need to be made if this candidate is selected and they're made in the subsystem construction states or the decision will influence the architecture selection process. We might choose a brand of instant coffee that isn't available in the office at this moment. If we have to send out to buy it, it may not be back by 3.30. So the properties of the cup of the instant coffee are shown here. We're back with water temperature and water amount and we have coffee amount is now one teaspoon. Sugar brand, sugar amount, no cremo. The water amount could be written as 375 plus or minus 5 mils or 370 to 380 mils. Which way is best? Hmm. I'm defining best as minimizing errors of commission. That is interpretation. Because 375 plus or minus 5 needs a calculation. Anytime there's a calculation there's an opportunity for an error and anytime there's an opportunity for an error there's a probability of the error not being caught. The lowest risk is use the range 370 to 380 milliliters. I don't remember that being taught anywhere. In this particular instance it's pretty easy to do the calculation but a decimal point could end up in the wrong place at any time. So lesson learned never use plus or minus always use a range. The commercial off-the-shelf purchase architecture is straightforward. There's a cup with a brew and there may or may not be sugar as part of the delivery or it may come separate. So the decisions here are which brand of commercial off the shelf, who to go get the coffee from, and to verify that the Cots cup of coffee meets or exceeds the attributes Fred needs, and any remaining customization on the amount of sugar. So the Cots cup of coffee properties look like this. It's all Cots, except the two teaspoons of sugar and no creamer. The architecture selection state started when Fred has the candidates, it contained Fred developing the selection criteria, deciding which decision making tool to use and making the decision and it ended when Fred selected the brewed coffee option with two teaspoons of sugar in the boss's cup and Fred has worked out how to brew the coffee so that it will be fresh at between 326 to 328 p.m. Why 326 to 328 p.m.? He's got to allow time to pour the coffee and then take it over to the boss's office so he'll be there at exactly 3.30. So here are the attributes of the final product. Clear, concise, atomic and so on. Fred's already asked a key question, what kind of coffee does the boss like? But now he has to ask the second question before he can finalize the decision. Can it be prepared in time? The answer is to be determined. That's a much better answer than saying Fred doesn't know. It means the same but it states it in a positive way. 
so Fred has to verify that it can be prepared in time, namely do some risk management. In this case he's going to prototype it. Fred does the prototyping and he finds out that yes it's feasible so the decision is made and the crema it milk is still zero. The subsystem construction state started when Fred worked out how to brew the coffee so it would be ready between 3.26 and 3.28 p.m. Fred preparing the ingredients and equipment, verifying the time shown by the clock on the wall is accurate because he plans to be at the boss's office at 3.30 by the clock on the wall. Again a little risk management because his wristwatch and the boss's wristwatch may be different. Reserving the coffee pot from 3 p.m. to 3.30, more risk management. He wants to make sure that the pot will be available because other people in the office are using the pot and he doesn't want somebody to overrun into his time. This is very important when building systems that require specialized equipment in the process like thermal vacuum chambers or vibration tables that are shared amongst different projects. Fred is waiting until 3.30 p.m. and starting to brew the coffee when the clock on the wall shows 3.30 p.m. and Fred getting the cup, spoon and serviette or napkin ready. Hey, wait a minute, where did that come from? Well, they're available. So Fred is going to exceed expectations at no extra cost. Or it could have come from the meta system which describe the use cases and the misuse cases. Spilling the coffee is a misuse case. And although Fred has designed the system to minimize the probability of spilling the coffee, a low probability doesn't necessarily mean it won't happen. And so the napkin is there just in case he spills the coffee as he puts it down on the boss's desk. If he spills it on the boss, well, tough. He'll stay away from the bus to make sure he doesn't spill it on her. And then Fred is getting the two teaspoons of sugar ready to add during the system integration state. This state ended the coffee's brewed and the cup sugar and serviette are ready. The subsystem testing states started when the coffee's brewed and the cup sugar and serviette are ready. It contained verifying the cup spoon cleanliness per health and welfare specification ABC 100 version 4.5.6. Not part of the, bu of the bus's need but it's imposed on Fred by the government. He's verifying the properties of the brewed cup match the properties of the brewed coffee the bus likes and spoon sugar and serviette are ready. So it ended when Fred has verified all the subsystems, cup, spoon, sugar, sugar and serviette are available. And we move on to the system integration and testing state which started when Fred had tested all the subsystems. Fred pouring the needed amount of coffee into the cup, adding two teaspoons of sugar, mixing the coffee and sugar, washing the spoon and place it in the dish rack in the kitchenette to dry. This is a process attribute imposed by office rules to make sure that the employees don't leave the kitchenette in a mess and the state ended when Fred has washed the spoon and placed it in the dish rack in the kitchenette to dry within the time limit specified by the office. So here's how we show some of the comparison or verification in object-oriented systems engineering. We don't compare requirements, we compare properties. And so you can see the properties of the brewed cup of coffee, the verification method and the as-built results. The cup's the bus's cup. We inspect a cup. Yep, it's the bus's cup. Okay, we don't need to know anything more. The coffee temperature, it's set by the pot specification which has been checked so the verification method is we feel the cup it feels hot enough. Fine. That's all we need to do. That's adequate. Move on. The coffee type is the Cots brand in the office. We inspect it and we find it's the International Coffee Premium Band. Okay. 
Good. Coffee amount. The desired attributes are 8 to 10 millimeters down from the cup lip. We measure it and it's approximately 9. We don't care whether it's 9, 9.1, 9.2. doesn't matter. It's within the range. The sugar type. We use the office sugar, we inspect it, and we find out it's best Cuban sugar premium variant. Okay. The sugar amount, two teaspoonsfuls, was measured when we added it to the cup. And while we were adding the sugar to the cup, we made sure that crema was not added. And that's why I carried crema all the way through. There are times when we need to know what attributes are not needed. A traditional requirements paradigm doesn't like writing negative requirements. It tries to write requirements in a positive way, sometimes really messing them up. With attributes, we don't mind. The attribute is zero. Okay, leave it like no problem. And then we get to the O and M state. The placement into service started when Fred integrated and verified the cup of coffee is ready for delivery, contained Fred waiting until 3.28 p.m., carrying the cup of coffee over to the boss's office, waiting till exactly 3.30 p.m., as shown on the clock, knocking on the boss's door, waiting for permission to enter the office, Fred opening the door carefully, entering the office and closing the door after him, Fred giving the cup of coffee and serving it to the boss by placing them on her desk, and it ended when Fred had given the cup of coffee and serviette to the boss without spilling it. And notice there's no tolerance on 3.28 and 3.30. Looking at the clock on the wall and wait until the big hand goes over the number 12 is acceptable. We've covered the placement of service on the previous page. There's no change management. The in-service O&M state, there's no change management. The boss drinking her coffee and not complaining about it about putting the cup back on the desk with or without using the serviette. There are no in-service upgrades and the system disposal state is not applicable. It's not Fred's problem, it's the boss's problem. So some of the lessons learned. Attributes ensure the information passed along the system development process is clear and concise with minimum errors. You've seen that. The critical front end is built into the OOSE system development process so it tends to remedy the correct problem. Inheritance and templates enhance the completeness of the watts. Models are not the only way to analyze a system. Models are not the only way to analyze a system. Did you notice Fred didn't use a model? He prototyped the process. The SDP and the system are tightly coupled. The solution system is the sum of the process and the product attributes. That's not what I learned here. I saw that written 50 or 60 years ago in a textbook and I don't quite remember where. The processes depend on the architectures which will impact the earlier estimated cost and schedule. When the project starts there's an estimate of cost and schedule but there's a lot of unknown information there as to exactly what will be the specific instance of the generic class of system that's being delivered and how it will be made and delivered and that impacts the earlier estimated costs and schedules. More lessons learned. These are more generic. The feasibility check needs to be performed in parallel with the development or in an iteration loop. For example, cost and schedule could have removed the cuts alternative from consideration during the preliminary architecture state. The architecture selection decision doesn't have to wait until Fred developed all three alternatives as the process standard specified. Once Fred asked the team leader what kind of coffee does the boss like, the decision was made. There was no need to follow the process and create the other architectures unless the feasibility study showed that Fred could not deliver the type of coffee the boss liked within the time limit. They were out of coffee, they were out of sugar or whatever. If there was a power cut, the only alternative architecture that would have helped was a commercial off-the-shelf product brought in from outside. Questions and comments. This is a YouTube video. So let me ask you a question. Why did the boss ask Fred to meet her at 3.30 p.m. in her office and bring her a cup of coffee? Talk to me and others in the online Oasis Cafe about object-oriented systems engineering, why the boss asked Fred to bring her that cup of coffee, and how to become an outstanding systems engineer using Zoom. The meeting ID is here. The passcode is here. You can also find that on my webpage. The Oasis Cafe is open daily Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. New York local time, irrespective of the clocks. And I'm generally there on Thursday. I'm also online for students and others Mondays at 8 a.m. Zurich, Switzerland local time, 
if I don't have a schedule conflict. And my thanks to Raid, Martin, Bruce, Niels, Gregory and Shirley who made useful comments in the online Inkosi fir tree and oasis cafes and in my classes during the preparation of this presentation. Have you recognized the defects in the requirement paradigm yet? Are you interested in the OOAC paradigm? Find out if you can make the transition. Join me in a small group of like-minded systems engineers and problem solvers for at least 30 days for free. Full access to two programs. Just go to my website, read through it, click, and the access is provided. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I hope it's given you something to think about. And I look forward to talking to you.